that, uh, some of the learning objectives I have for this class. I want you to be able to understand design principles and how they affect design and your choice and what you're doing with your design. Uh, understand Sketchbook Designer, oh, how it, how it supports the phases of design. We'll go over those. Sketchbook Designer is a tool for idea generation and the vector tools uh, and how to do some VizCom rendering, some really nice kind of clean rendering like this helmet that I've got in the backdrop. So, to simplify all those words, we're going to start off talking about design principles. Then we'll talk about phases of design and jump into the sketchbook designer and I'll do more live like tools to show you as what, how I would use uh, sketchbook designer as an ideation tool and also doing painting. So, here we go, design principles. So I, I put these ones in there. There are obviously more, um, but I thought we could at least kind of talk about these ones. So um, form follows function, character description and backstory, really understanding what your either character or your design is, right? Stance, posture, or gesture. And I've got images in a minute, so we'll hit them one by one. Shape and silhouette, value graphics, surface and form of your object, and the color and the texture and material. Okay. And on the bottom, I said a good design should capture your interest, both a kind of a distance shot where you go, hey, that's really interesting. And it works for characters as well as it does for, say, nice design. If I see, say, a Volkswagen Beetle from really far away, I instantly recognize what that is, right? Um, if I see a little shot of, say, uh, one of the Simpsons characters, I know exactly which one it is without having to have it blown up big, right? Um, so a good, a good silhouette should do that. But also should be really interesting up close and really up close. I should, be, I should be able to find interest at many stages of, of the uh, uh, distances. Okay, so the first one, uh, design principles, form follows function. And these, I'm just kind of hitting these, but it should help us as you start thinking about um, what you're designing because something that is, needs to be very fast or entirely strong, if I'm not using good engineering criteria underneath, then I might as well not be designing it. Uh, my first boss at General Motors uh, when I got the job, he said, I, I was worried because I didn't feel that I had the same sketching chops that a lot of the other designers had uh, that were coming from Art Center and other places. And he said, I've got plenty of wallpaper decorators. I need someone who can think. And, uh, and that's basically someone who can kind of think about some of these things behind the design and not just start sketching what he used to call chrome potatoes. Um, all right, so here we go. So uh, another design principle, the character description and backstory. Um, brand character for vehicles. Um, this was an assignment I gave to my, my MFA students uh, in transportation about doing James Bond vehicles. And I assigned them all different, uh, different vehicles. So they had to stick to the brand character of, say, Porsche or, uh, or Bentley or some of the other ones that we went through. And this was an old Porsche one. This was my, that's my sketch, just a top view of it. Um, and, but it still works the same with people and characters, right? Um, the, uh, if you have a good backstory um, then, and a good understanding of who the character is, you'll design a better product for that. And in this case, a kid with a lot of imagination like my children. Okay. So, um, stance and posture. I did not design the Lamborghini, but it is nice. But it has a wonderful stance, a very aggressive stance. Uh, and if you're trying to imbue your, your design with some life, Think about um, what, what is the, uh, the gesture or the curve. In this case, it's pretty obvious. You know, the, the creature has this really kind of fun S shape, but it's kind of broken. So he's not, kind of, he's not a really smooth creature. He's got a lot of quirks and kinks in his, in his personality, and the kids do too. Um, and obviously, they're trying to really imbue the design with a lot of emotion. So, um, so basically, stance and posture, gesture, and like I said, it works the same across boundaries here. Okay. Uh, another principle, shape and silhouettes. So shape conveys a lot of meaning. And uh, I've got a, a slide after this that's far more interesting to look at than the black and white one. But basically, you know, if I'm designing a character that needs to be the evil, um, you know, the, 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 the villain, I'm not going to design them all clean and round because you're just not going to get that sense. Um, you're going to design an evil character with a lot of sharp things, extra little things hanging off, but you're going to want to make him feel dangerous. 
And the same thing works with a, with a product. Um, obviously, if I'm doing a product I want people to be aware of, sharper edges are going to keep people like, OK, or, or sharper colors and things like that are going to make people think twice about putting their finger on the blade. Um, and, uh, and so round conveys safety and friendship. Squares are very stable. Uh, sharp forms aggression and energy. And as an example, I grabbed a couple images from Star Trek. If you notice, the humans in the Federation is always friendly. They will never go away from that. They, they, need, they need you to believe that you are a good guy. And, uh, and you know, the Borg or the, uh, the Romulus, right? Um, very evil. But they each have their own separate brand character. Um, when they did this movie, obviously it's different, but it's, but it's like the main ship was square, I believe. Is that right? And, uh, but it's very like techno and very different than what happened over here, which is very sharp and dangerous. Everything about that is meant to be scary. And, uh, but everything about even these iterations on the Star Trek vehicle are clean, smooth, and friendly. Beautiful, simple, graceful uh, blendings between the different shapes. You feel safe with those. You feel like that guy can take care of you. OK. This starts to be interesting. When you start designing, um, I, I went to a couple of lectures, and, and I spent some time with some of the other designers and, and concept designers. And, uh, and I never really thought about this until it was brought to my attention by Scott Robertson. Um, and and he, he said that the value graphics on a product are more important than the shape, or, the, or than the, not the shape, but the, uh, than the form. And I was like, no way. Form is so important. That's what I care about. I'm always sculpting things, trying to make things look really neat. And, uh, and you know what? It's true. If you stand back or squint your eyes, you have no idea what the actual shape of this drill is. But the black and yellow really stand out. That's, that comes across before the actual surface of this does. Um, you can break shape up using things like camouflage. And uh, there's a lot of, it's, it's just a really important element to think about in, in, in a design. If you do this beautiful job designing something and then you hide it with bad value graphics, you've lost all that time. It's just, it's just sad, I guess. OK. Uh, this is something that is really important, too. So when you do start getting into surface and form, and we are going to stay in 2D. We are getting into sketchbook designer. Uh, but I do want to just, I'm just trying to instill some of these principles right now. Um, each of these different uh, ways to draw have meaning. And they have meaning whether you want them to or not. So kind of a positional line, a polyline, or a, pol or a polygonal uh, um, surface where it's like positional surfacing will give you a certain feeling and a tangent and curvature will give you something else. So as examples, uh, things that have positional uh, continuity between the surfaces, like the stealth fighter, um, these things happen in nature. So you get things like honeycombs. You get the, uh, the giant's causeway in Norway, I believe it is. And diamond, well, diamonds are cut that way. That's different. But um, you, get a, you get a sense of precision. You get a sense of, of something that's technical, something that's very structural. And so if you design something, if that's what you want your brand character to be for the product you're creating, um, maybe having some nice, clean, straight edges might be something that you might want to try to infuse into some of the design. Things that are tangent. What's interesting about tangency is it's man-made. It doesn't actually occur in nature. You could, I guess you could sand off rocks to make them that way. But they're either jagged or they're clean and curved. And uh, in this case, um, things like drills, cameras, Dell notebook, right, or laptop, and things like, in this case, that Jeep Wrangler are purpose built. It's controlled. It's thought out. And sometimes that's wh exactly what you want, right? In this case, Jeep purposely makes that very controlled and very simple, straight edges with rounds, so that you know that this was manufactured for you. Um, it can be a really important design decision. Things that are curvature, on the other hand, um, and I was a car designer, so I keep doing car references. It's just easy for me. Um, but things that really have a lot of flow to them. Nature is, is curvature. Almost everything in nature has flow. And uh, a couple wonderful examples of automobiles that do as well. It's organic. It's smooth. It flows. And it, it'll give you the sensation of elegance, generally. OK, so here's the interesting thing is you can take those things that, that convey meaning and you can mix them. 
And uh, Gray Holland taught a class here a few years back, and he, he did something like this as well. But, um, but Apple is really good about this. They don't want you to buy a purpose-built laptop like, say, this, but I own, whatever this is. Um, they want you to buy an elegant piece of jewelry um, that you can say, this is mine. I care about this thing. This is, this is my laptop. I own this. Um, and so they have curvature. You notice it's not just a flat top. It blends over the top. And certain, some of their laptops really have a lot of flow. And if you, build, if you see the model in Alias, which they model these in, it has beautiful curvature continuity. OK, so it's purpose-built elegance. And they do this on purpose to tell you that I built this for you. It's going to do the job you need. But it's also an elegant thing. OK, mixing surfacing again. So I brought the Lamborghini back because it has all this beautiful curvature flow as, as, as surfaces kind of bend and twist and flow. But it also is really cut up. And it's got diamond hard edges as well. Um, in this case, this uh, Skidoo has the same thing going on. It's, they're trying to tell you, in, in not so many words, that it's got position, or that it's, it's precise and it's elegant. Um, in the case with the, uh, with the ski do, it's more sport. And, but it's also, it's got a little bit of precision and elegance in it as well. So, OK. Almost done with the principles here. OK. Um, color, uh, just a quick touch on this. I didn't show any examples. But um, things that are low contrast and cool colors are generally very soothing. You can make them pale and kind of creepy if you want as well. But generally, you'd think, OK, a, a neat product for a hospital, maybe a light blue with a white um, will be something that's really quite nice. Uh, low contrast, warm colors, something cozy. I think of uh, going into a lot of um, some restaurants where you don't feel, um, I guess, uh, you don't feel like you have to get out. You can stay there a while. You feel comfortable there. Things that are high contrast, high chroma, um, high color, that is. Um, action sports, that can also, well, primary colors, it's similar to that, are going to be like things like children's toys. It conveys an honesty and pureness if it's these beautiful, simple, beautiful colors. Um, and neutral colors can be very businesslike. So generally, um, like the, the grays that you, we used to get in all the ugly computers, uh, but even like blacks and grays um, can convey, this is a business opportunity or business uh, tool that you should be focused on. Uh, it's not about going off on the weekend and enjoying yourself, maybe. OK. Um, OK, we'll get into texture and material. Um, one thing I want to mention also, so going from the silhouette and shape down through the, the, uh, the value graphics and into form, it kind of goes in order. Uh, those are things that are really, really important. If you don't have those things in order, um, you, know, you could have these wonderful materials, but if the shape's are horrible, you've lost your, your design, right? So uh, once we get past that, it's time to think about, OK, what kind of materials do I want to place on this? And sometimes this can affect the value graphics. But things like uh, things that textures and materials can tell you, if it's a rough or a dull surface, you know, it might be a low budget part, but it also might be that you're just hiding um, kind of poor quality. Or it might be something you're really trying to like, um, show off, that I'm a rustic, tough, um, brute piece of uh, uh, whatever it might be. I'm a, I'm a durable good. Things that are shiny, um, usually we'll try to, you'll try to convey uh, luxury with that. Soft touch, you don't want to touch the thing. You want to pick it up. It, just, it, 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 it beckons you to touch it, right? And then things that are textured. I think of things like good grips. You know, it's got the soft touch rubber, but it also has this neat pattern of texture on it. You can't help but grab those things. You just want to like rub your fingers across them. And things like lights are a wonderful way to convey information. It draws your attention automatically, uh, and you can't get away from it. OK. So, um, these are the, so we've gone through the, 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 uh, the different uh, design principles that I wanted to talk about. And when you, when you kind of get those things loaded in your head and you start designing things, hopefully you start coming up with some amazing things. And I, I wanted to talk about some phases of design. And then we'll get right into the software. But to start off with this, um, it's important to do good research. Um, do so a lot of idea generations, and then jump into the refinement, concept ex execution, present presentation renderings. And then I just threw also in that when you're working with engineers or sculptors, you need to be able to communicate. And Sketchbook Pro is wonderful for that. So um, with that, 
I recorded doing this helmet from scratch. And then uh, we'll, we'll watch this go. I think it's about eight minutes or so. Because um, I sped it up probably 800%. I hope it doesn't hurt your eyes. Um, but at least you get to see like something start to end without, uh, without uh, me cheating. And I could have done this, but it would have taken the entire class just to do this. And I wouldn't have been able to talk while I did it as well. So um, I didn't show any of the uh, research that I have, but I've done quite a bit of research going online looking at things. What I thought I'd do with this is um, come up with a, like a paintball helmet. And my target audience is kind of the, the kid who plays video games, Gears of War, and that's what he wants. Like he could have a, a normal helmet, but that's not going to help him out. He needs, he needs something that looks like it belongs in a video game. And so, uh, and I also wanted to have it be a bit more technical and nice, because this is the professional. This is maybe someone in his 30s who still goes out paintballing and loves it. So um, what I showed there a minute ago was some of the tools in Sketchbook. And I'll go into these manually in a few, well, in 15 minutes or so, and do, this, do a lot of this manually for you. But I love the symmetry that you get in Sketchbook Designer. Sketchbook Pro as well, but Sketchbook Designer has got a really beautiful feature in the fact that once you've painted something, you can distort it and watch the symmetry continue to update. And that is really, really cool. Um, and so then I just tom I toned down the opacity and sketched on one half because I like to be able to sketch through the center line. And I know I can always toggle on the symmetry after the afterward. Um, I wanted to do my final drawing in side view in this case. So um, I just made a new layer, dimmed that out, and just made a couple streaks going across just to uh, be able to find major placements of what I wanted to do here. And this is just, I would consider this still ideation phase. Uh, normally, I would probably spend a couple days just drawing a whole bunch of little things. And I've got some drawings after this, I can show you that. But uh, in this case, I kind of already had a couple good ideas because I'd been drawing helmets for a couple weeks just kind of in my notebooks and in Sketchbook Pro. So I was like, I got a couple ideas I want to go on. I'll just see where I go. But I had already had a, a pretty good feeling of what I wanted to do. And, and kind of using that front view kind of as a guide, but I'm keeping it loose because this is my hero. The side view is my hero kind of shot that I care about. So I might make some changes here. And I thought, well, what if that was round around the ear? Um, and you know, as a paintball thing, hopefully, I've got a couple air intakes so you can defog, but it's probably going to fog up pretty good. And I'm not worried super. I'm not super worried about the manufacturability. I also realized that this might be kind of a problem getting off my head, um, depending on how far in that chin goes. But that's okay. I'm drawing. Okay, so once I've kind of decided on on a design a design decision, which I think actually I'm still kind of like looking for. Uh, looking for options here. In a minute, I'll get to the point where I'm like, OK, now I'm going to refine this and really make a strong statement on, on what this actual design is. OK, so I think I've dimmed this out. I decide which one of these two I want to go with and then uh, jump into it. Any questions while this is kind of going? Otherwise, we'll just watch. I'm going to get a drink, too. Okay, so now that I've kind of, I've got a kind of a refined design that I like, I'm going to go and do some, uh, some really clean lines, because this is what I would be handing off to someone who I'd be working with in manufacturing, or someone who might be sculpting this for me or working with me. And you'll notice I'm using straight poly lines, and it's like, why on earth would I do that? Um, I like this because afterwards, there's this beautiful fillet tool. And... I like, in this case, I like that purpose-built kind of thing that I was showing you before. I got a straight line, a tangent straight line. Because um, I want this to feel a little bit more like a Jeep in the end, or like a military thing. Um, if I was trying to make this for, I don't know, uh, Martha Stewart, that's not a good example. I might go really smooth, all clean lines. Someone who's going to own a Lamborghini, I'd be a little, a little less line, round line, right? And... Uh, so these straight lines, and then just coming back in and putting fillets in with this remarkably easy-to-use tool is, uh, 
is beautiful. And I used to use Illustrator. I hate using those curves now that I've been able to play in this because this is intuitive and fast, and you can warp things just as easy as you can, uh, um, I don't know, play with them. It's really, really quite nice. And here I struggled a little bit. One of the things I, so um, talk about some of the things I love about this product and also a couple of things that I'm a little bit frustrated with. When you do have a lot of curves coming over the top of each other, it can be a little frustrating. And you know, looking back on this, if I wasn't doing this on the fly while being recorded, I probably would have taken those features and made a different layer so I wasn't kind of interacting with multiple curves at the same time. Okay, so once I've got the curves done, it's time to start my, my final presentation rendering. And I'm just putting some base colors in, looking at graphics a little bit, but in the end I decided to just go kind of like monochromatic, um, kind of pretend metal head. And uh, I guess I've been watching too much Iron Man. Uh, and so there's a lot of different ways to, to mask in, in Sketchbook Designer. And in this case, I decided to stick with the old uh, uh, magic wand, where you basically just get a flat color and select it. And then up in my masking tools, I can just say, convert that selection to a mask. I could have created those vectors as masks as well. Uh, but there's a number of different ways you can, you can mask. And I, we'll go over all of them, actually, in a little bit. Is this speed really fast, or does it feel kind of like, oh, I get it? It's kind of nice? OK, good. Probably an hour and a half, maybe a little less. It's, I'm, I'd, have to, I'd have to like actually find out how long it is and then, and then divide it. Part of the problem was, was, I was it was kind of during school. It was between classes. So I was teaching, and then I jumped in, and people would come walk in the room and ask me questions like, OK, pause. And it gets a little confusing. Um, although one of the things I have to say I love about both Sketchbook Designer and Sketchbook is that um, they're simple. You don't have to jump out of your head to find a menu usually. Sketchbook Designer a little bit more so, but Sketchbook, you're just drawing. You want to erase? You erase. You don't, you don't think about anything. If I'm in Photoshop, and I use Photoshop all the time, all the time I'll, I'll be sketching and I'll go, okay, I need to find this other tool. Where is it? Okay, there it is. And it's, I, I love that these tools were designed for designers. And uh, you're able to just kind of just jump in and think about it. And, or without thinking about it, you can just paint. Um, but while this is going, how many people are, are like industrial designers in the room? Okay, good handful. How many people are like, I don't know, uh, entertainment? Like I'm concept designer entertainment. There's a handful. Okay, great. Um, other people, animation or product design? What, what do we have in here? Yeah, uh, well, I'll, I'll, let me throw it out. Uh, like more like modeling surface, surfacers, like alias and things? A handful of people, OK. Um, people who I have not talked to, manufacturing? I think there's a, a few people in, in architecture you mentioned. OK. All right, so hopefully this is still applicable <laughs> to you guys. Um, I mean, I, I, I would use this regardless of what I was in, uh, because I find it intuitive. I, I draw all the time. I have notes from church where I'm just drawing people. I, I, I just do it. OK, so uh, some of the VizCon things we're going to go over in a little bit is I will paint out basically just simple, like basically paint it all out um, opaquely, and then come back over it and paint highlights in it, core shadows. Um, it's just a simple, flat eraser, although I'm starting to tighten it up and make it a bit more highly polished. And the more uh, specular shading, specular shading uh, the white parts that I put on there, the more it's going to feel like it's a polished piece and it's starting to get reflective. Um, one thing I have done, and we'll, we'll play with this a little bit later on, is I turn those curves that I use to mask it with into what's called guide curves. I could just use the stroke, um, but I don't really like the vector renders. In the end, I convert them all to, to pixels, basically, to paint layers. And then I'll turn all the curves into uh, snappable um, magnets, right? And so then I can take any pencil I want and just kind of snap to it and kind of push the, push the highlights where I really want them to be. And I can get some incredibly tight cut lines uh, because I can snap to an edge or the center of any curve with a pencil. And I really love that feature. Do 
Uh, oh, my, my 2D sketchbook? I have filled up so many notebooks from the airplane. I find, oh, it was so nice to be on the airplane, quite honestly. I had like three hours to, uh, to not have emails coming at me, and I drew the whole time. Yeah. And uh, in other people's lectures that I've been to, I've filled up maybe 20 pages of sketches. I draw a lot. Um, if you want to draw like this, it's not that you can't do it. You just need to draw a lot. That's basically what it boils down to. Um, I'm putting some cushion in inside the uh, the helmet. I, I made it transparent. I used that same head model that I had sculpted in ZBrush, um, and I that's just kind of behind the head or behind the the painting. And I made the glass uh, slightly transparent now, so it looks like it looks like there's a guy inside there. Um, these texture brushes, I've I've built these ones. I think you can download them. I'm not totally sure from Autodesk website. You used to be able to download them in Sketchbook Pro. And I'll talk to Chris Jung and see if he's got this still there or not. But you should be able to download these things um, from the Autodesk website. And they're basically just simple brushes that I've created. And we'll make one or two. And then you can just kind of swipe them, drag them, and use them as features. It's kind of like all the people that use Inventor. Anyone used Inventor here? A couple? OK. You know, you have the big, these feature lists. Well, you've already got built parts for screws and whatever it might be. Why don't designers have that for sketching, right? And so I just thought, you know, if I'm, always, if, I, if I'm almost always sketching something with a top light, and maybe it's a little, the light might be a little bit off to the left, but it's almost the same thing every time, I might as well make a bunch of little buttons and screws and things like that that have the same lighting condition, and I can just stamp them on. And I don't have to draw that every single time. And I can still be a designer and think about where I place them. I thought it might be nice if I'm getting shot with a paintball in the neck, to, uh, to have some like metal ribbing there to kind of diffuse the, the pain. Um, so, uh, I mean, maybe the, the collared neck thing would do it enough, but I thought, you know what, as long as I'm designing this and I have an infinite budget, um, I might as well go with the, with the metal uh, ribs. Okay, this is almost completed. So at this point, I mean, it looks like it could be done, but I haven't, I haven't placed any texture on the model. And so I thought, well, let's see if there's any decent um, cloth type textures. And uh, I think I grabbed this one from Mudbox. I'm not totally sure. And then I'm just using some of the layer filters in here to use overlay or multiply just to see what looks best uh, given the texture sample that I ended up using. Um, and now I'm going to use a curve and place one of these. So I've got like leather brush here and, uh, and some stitching. And so basically, I'm just saying, OK, that's where I want my seam to be. And then I'm going to place my stitches right up inside the seam. And, and then using, turning it into guide, guide curves, I can make the right side of this have a little bit of a highlight and the left side have a little bit of a shadow. So it really feels like it kind of puckers in. And yeah. So now it's time to make this helmet look like it's got some interesting texture on top of it. And so all I'm really doing here is underneath my highlight layer, I believe, is what I've got here. I have to look, because it's been a while since I did this. I'm placing um, some texture. And it's actually a scan from a frying pan. Um, and so I'm placing that wherever I want this material to look like a little bit grungy, a little bit more scarred up. Because you know, quite honestly, the guy who plays Gears of War doesn't want a clean, shiny um, uh, motorcycle helmet, right? He wants this to look like he's been in a been in the war. So now I'm basically just creating some simple reflections um, using the curves again because they're easy to control. Um, I'm going to turn off the stroke in a minute and just fill this with, with this kind of a white gradient and toggle off the stroke so you can't see that. And then I'm just blending it back down to like 10% or so, maybe 40%, 20%. There you go. I just try to find a place for that. Um, Thanks. Uh, oh, CG Tech. What is that place called? I have to go online. I've got links to all, my, all this stuff I go to. But there's a lot of textures you can you can download for free. Um, certain amount of textures a day at uh, CG Textures, yeah. And so you can download like five 4K maps or something like that a day or something ridiculous. And so I usually do that. I have my students do that. Some of them have collected huge libraries where they all like okay, you get the you get the 
you know, the metal and I'll get these and you get the wood and pretty soon there's just gobs and gobs of libraries. Um, also, uh, you get some like, I've got some Gnomon videos and some of them have like metal textures. I think this, this one might be one. I didn't scan this in. But uh, anyway, so, all right. So that's sketching or basically the full thing. So now we'll walk through this a little bit slower um, and talk about each one of these phases of design. And these are kind of important if you're doing freelance or, or just even working with uh, you know, any boss, quite honestly, um, or just trying to organize your thoughts. Because it's, it's a good thing to like, okay, I know I want to spend so much time doing research because otherwise I'm just going to jump in. Someone's going to say, I need you to do a helmet for me. And he's going to budget you know, 20 hours to do the whole thing. I should be spending you know, over half of that just researching it, just looking at what it, what's out there on the market and maybe who my customer is and trying to figure out what's going on. And so I need to make sure I, I talk to whoever's paying me and say, I need time for each of these phases um, and, and it's going to take this long. They'll, they, they'll understand it if you can properly talk about it, right? So phase one, using sketchbook for research, I'm still going to go online and find a bunch of images. Like I said, I wanted this to feel more like the guy who's a gamer rather than the guy who's like got a motorcycle. In the end, it's somewhere closer to the motorcycle probably, but whatever. So I found these cool gas masks and helmets from like police officers, riot, riot gear. And I thought, that's kind of cool. So I just found a bunch of stuff, dropped them all into Sketchbook Designer, and just started taking notes. Um, I actually had pages of this kind of stuff, but I just kind of grabbed one. And I thought, you know, that is like a really weird and interesting helmet. Um, I mean, some of these are just really cool. That's a, that's a pilot from Russia. Um, but I thought, this area is really fascinating, too, with these fasteners that are exposed. I didn't end up using any of those. But I, if I would have, I would have probably created my own texture brush of fasteners. And then I could have splatted it on a couple different places. OK, so notes. Um, yeah. OK, second phase, um, coming up with a lot of different ideas. And I like using silhouettes, which is part of this, right? to just really quickly come up with ideas. In this case, Sketchbook has, has symmetry, but I ended up using, uh, oh, what's the software called? Um, hold on a second. I'll find it in just a second. It's called, I used Escape. Oh, Alchemy. I, found it, I thought about it just before I got there. OK. Um, I used Alchemy to, uh, to come up with these from current slide. These quick uh, sketches here. I could have just painted them, but um, Alchemy, it's, this is a weird mix. It's a free software. You just download it. Um, you just take, it's like vector lines, but they automatically create shape for you. And you can have it be symmetrical, so you just quickly do it. And it's kind of nice. Um, you can't do, there's no undos in the software, so if you end up using it, don't worry about being frustrated. It's all about just coming up with happy accidents as you go. That's pretty cool. And then I took it back to Sketchbook Designer to just do some quick, what on earth did I create with these silhouettes? Um, but I love Sketchbook because simplicity and focus, right? Um, and also, you've got the layers. It's like my, my Sketchbook down here, except for that I can make mistakes and erase them if I want to, because I've got layers. I can also make iterations, which is really important. OK, here's a bunch of other just kind of quick thumbnails. Uh, some of these are scans from my notebook, but most of them are inside of Sketchbook Designer. Um, and then some of them, I did some quick silhouettes in Sketchbook Designer. I copied it to Photoshop, and I used the cutout filter, um, which will kind of like hard edge the silhouettes. It was kind of just a fun experiment to see what happened. But you can come up with a lot of cool ideas, and they'll grab your eye, and they don't take very long, because you're, just doing, you're not wasting any time. You're just coming up with a lot of thoughts. Um, it's really important. Another thing that's important about doing these things small is it really doesn't matter if the perspective is off or not. You're just coming up with an idea. You're, you're not going to show this to a client. It's just coming up with a lot of ideas quick. OK. This is something I love about Sketchbook Designer. Um, you can take a photo. In this case, I think it's a Buick um, that I took and throw it into that symmetry. And we'll do this in a minute. It's just fun. And uh, you just start twisting the image around with the mirror on. And it's like photo booth, except for that you're using photographs. Um, and I just think this is really fascinating as, say, maybe a center stack for that vehicle. Um, you know, I'd have to like dim it down and just draw over the top of it. 
But I wouldn't have thought to design it that way because it's just interesting angles. Um, in this case, I got a model of a um, ski do, and I took a shot of it in the side view, side view, and then I brought it in. I started doing some symmetry studies. Um, so I've got some really weird and fascinating shots. And then the seat is actually part of the front that was mirrored. And then I basically just kind of erased out the part that didn't make any sense, put a couple highlights on it. And that seat is just, it's just, it's one of the other two. It's just, it's just one of the symmetries with a couple pencil lines over the top of it to help it stand out a little bit better. Um, and that's cooler than the one that's on there unless someone designed that in the room. Okay. Okay. Okay, so once you kind of get a lot of ideas out there, it's time to start refining it. And refinement, it can still be kind of loose, but it's just kind of really figuring out what on earth this design is. And so uh, choosing one of the design directions and flush it out. Um, some of the tools that Sketchbook has that are kind of cool, if you use the, uh, the vector curves as you paint, you can smooth them out, which is kind of cool. We'll play with that. Has everyone used Sketchbook Designer? I didn't ask that. Okay, so only a few, half of it, less than half. That's good. I'll, I'll, I'll play with it a little more than I thought. That's good, though. Um, it's not very hard to learn, so that's nice. Um, it's got some wonderful tools in there to help with line quality. And we'll look at those. Another thing that helps with refinement is making sure that your perspective is on. So something that, that Sketchbook Designer has um, is it's got perspective grid lines in there which is really nice. I wish it did proper three-point perspective. It does two-point perspective. It looks like it does three-point perspective, but it really is two-point. Um, so as long as you're not doing a really cranked view, like maybe an architecture, where I might want to see the world as it kind of shifts down, um, that's not, these grid lines won't help you because they're really only two-point perspective, quite honestly. Um, but they're, it's really, really nice because I can just put those two points wherever I want. I can match a photograph. And then I'm just sketching with these wonderful grids, and it's easy. OK, um, then sketching over 3D images. I do this all the time. Uh, this is, uh, I think these are both from Alias, um, a quick car model that I had and a snowmobile model. Um, just take a screen grab, bring it in, and start sketching over the top. You're not going to blow the package. You're refining the idea over the package, so it's not going to have to change much. OK, uh, did I skip one? No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, concept execution, this is more just defining the entire design in this case. And so in this case, I did a flying motorcycle. I don't know. It's like a pod racer without the extra piece, right? Um, and so I've got my character on a bike stance. And I did a side view first. Well, I did this some quick kind of perspective shots. And then I did a side view. And then I did a top view directly after that using just kind of laying out some grids so I know exactly where things should or should not be. And now I've got my top and my, and my side. It's really easy to figure out the other two directions. Uh, I didn't do a perspective. Well, I, I actually I did paint a perspective. But uh, what I would normally do um, is maybe take this top view and just warp it in perspective so it matches the grid line. And I'll have a perspective top view of this thing. And then I can just start flushing out the volumes. And I'll know it'll be pretty accurate. We'll do that later, too. Concept execution, this is just what I showed you before. Um, the way that uh, the sketchbook handles curves is delightful. Um, they, it's a wonderful way to, to clean up curves. OK, so here's the perspective rendering of, of that same bike, which you can't really see as well up there as I can. But uh, the reason for, for this view is not so much for the guys who are doing the manufacturing. I mean, it really will help. But it's mostly to sell the idea. Um, and I'll take a longer time on this simply because I need to make sure that my manager or the person I'm doing this design for will care about this. They need to have that. If I can't sell them, um, then the idea might just die on the vine. So I need to make, make the decision makers know that this is a great idea. Um, I, I, I wrote down logos and text. Um, you can place logos over the top of this. Text. Um, Sketchbook Designer, it does have text, but it, it doesn't seem super intuitive or useful. Um, so I would still probably take it into Photoshop. Or else, you know what, having editable, te editable text, doing it in something like Illustrator or uh, PowerPoint, for that matter, 
where I can edit the text anytime if I had some spelling errors is a great way to go. All right, we're almost to the get back into the software time. Uh, presentation renderings. Uh, this is basically my visual development process. Sketch the thing up um, and then basically start. Well, here we go. So um, in this case, we'll, we'll do one of these. Uh, um, get a silhouette, something that might be interesting. Um, add some simple shading. So I've got some highlights, some core shadows. Um, add some cut lines to it in this case. Um, so this is like one layer up at a time. I wanted to make sure that my cut lines uh, were in there underneath other things. So I've got that. I've got logos. Um, I built up the highlights a little bit tighter because I thought it looked a little bit nicer to punch them. And then I overlaid a texture. Oh, I also, it's important to warp textures and logos. You know, if this is a real surface, that needs to, that needs to mold over the top of that surface. And so rather than just laying a texture over the top, take it and just kind of bend it around a little bit. Squish it. And there's wonderful tools in there for doing that. And then adding reflection pass. Okay. Lastly, communication with uh, production, like engineers and sculptors. Um, it is invaluable when I work at GM to be able to take and work with a sculptor. And they'd start building my model in Alias. And I could just take a screen grab and draw over the top of that and say, yeah, the shape is right, but I want, you know, I want right across that edge, I want that to be where the cut line is. Or maybe I want um, the cut line to, to fall right after the, the bend in the material. It's just really important. And, and visual, visual communication is so important. It's beautiful. Um, also, uh, as I mentioned before, if you draw over the top of a package, um, then the people you're working with are doing the modeling. Know you're not cheating. And they feel a lot more comfortable with you as a designer. So being able to show them, yeah, this will fit. Notice. It fits. is really good. OK. One more video. And I think this is the last video for you. Um, I put this in here because I did a presentation recently on polygon modeling to, or to uh, car designers. And I thought it was applicable. Um, let me just watch. This one's even faster. This is like 1,200%. So this one might hurt your eyes a little bit. But, um, but basically, um, I made a quick gear shift. Simple. And then I used this tool called Mirror Cut in, in Maya, which is really brilliant as a design tool. I don't, it's probably not very useful for other reasons, but it's brilliant as a design tool because I can just kind of play with it and say, hey, what's that shape? It's the same thing as playing with the uh, symmetry sketching in, um, in, show, or in uh, Sketchbook. And I thought, okay, that's interesting. Now I need to clarify what this thing is. And so we'll take a screen grab and go into Sketchbook and do something about it. So you know, obviously add a lot more detail, change things. But that design I probably wouldn't have come up with on my own. It was a happy, informed accident that I created. Um, and I guess that's the point. I, I think you, know, you, you call them happy accidents. Wow, I made this cool happy accident. But it's not exactly that. It's something that I, I took the time to orchestrate a happy accident. And I think that's something that, that we can all do as we, uh, as we use things like proper imagery. Like say if I am going to use the symmetry sketching, which we'll do here in just a minute. Um, there we go. We'll start doing the symmetry sketching. Um, if I know that, say, I'm doing a, a vehicle or a product that needs to look serious, it needs to have an appropriate stance or attitude, if I take a vehicle, uh, say, say if I want to do something that, that feels militaristic, why don't I take something from an image from a, a military vehicle, bring it in, and start playing with that? I might find some really cool happy accidents, but they're going to, they're just by their very nature, are going to have some of that feeling. So my character designers, when we do creatures, uh, uh, we'll do like water creatures. And they'll, they'll find images of jellyfish, bring them in, do the mirror symmetry. And they'll come up with alien creatures that look very aquatic, because that's where they're taking their inspiration from. Uh, let me get rid of this so it doesn't slow me down or something. Oh, here we go. Come on. I think I need to get out of that. There we go. Great. OK. Um, actually, before I get into this, we'll just do a little bit of sketching. So people, so a lot of you have never been in Sketchbook uh, Designer, right? OK. So I should find out what time it is. Does this class end at 
Is that right? Okay, good. All right, so um, by default, much like Sketchbook Pro, um, there are paint layers, and the paint layers should feel you know, very smooth and clean. Uh, it's, it's the same paint engine, so oh, and let me grab a regular brush too. Um, so I've got really clean lines that flow, and it's a delight to just come up with designs with because you're just sketching and having a good time, right? Um, now, that's pretty neat. Um, then you can get on to the vector. So the vector ones, it's going to look the same, but the thing with the vector ones are that I can select the curve, I can add points to it, and bend, bend that stroke around. So maybe I'm, I just really need to nail a certain thing. It, it might be a lot nicer to just come in and, and uh, you know, grab this curve. I'll use a bigger brush that's easier to see. Toggle that guy off. And delete these because they just don't look good. Okay, so, so maybe I do that and I'm like, well, that's, it's a little bit kinked there. I don't really like that. But, you know, it is just a curve. Some of the features in Sketchbook Designer are this little widget, once you draw something, it might, like if I click it, it'll say, were you trying to do an ellipse? Or were you trying to do an arc? Or were you trying to do a straight line, maybe? Because it didn't look like that. Um, but it also, right now, I've got this tangency right here. So if I can up this tangency, notice how it smooths it out. It's using this radius as, I don't want to be any smaller than that radius. So I can completely clean up that line, that simple stroke, um, by dragging this around. If that still doesn't work, I've got options in here to change things. So uh, like this one right here will allow me to just kind of draw other strokes. And it'll just kind of blend into them and kind of find a happy medium between the two. So yeah, I kind of like that maybe. Or maybe I want it to bend up there a little bit more. I don't know how they do this. It's neat, though. <laughs> so, I don't know. Okay, um, and another thing that's kind of cool is, like, it doesn't really matter what these different strokes are because they are all curves, and I can come in after the fact and combine them. So this is my, probably my favorite tool in here. It's the, uh, the simple little fillet, right? And I can select this curve, and I can select that curve, and it combines them, but it's not quite, I haven't hit the accept button, so I could kind of play with where that rests. Uh, maybe you want it to blend in at a slightly different uh, angle. Hit enter there, okay, that's interesting. Grab this one. I'm not sure to tell which of those two curves is the one I really care about, but um, it shouldn't matter too much because, um, you know, I can come into the tool Oh, that's the, we go into here. Select this curve right here. You can go into the tool and, ah, and it's got different things. Like right now it's a paintbrush type. It could be a pencil. It could be uh, a marker maybe. And you can kind of like play with these things after the fact. You can change the rotation. Any, any of the attributes that are in here, because it is a curve, you can play with it after the fact. Now, that's really cool. In the end, I tend not to use these very much because if I'm because I draw fast. Some people might be very pragmatic about the way they draw, but when I'm drawing, I'm usually drawing some eyes in here, nose, and I just I just start flying. And this thing, it tries to like fix my curves a little bit, and I might accidentally be grabbing this little button right here, and it it, it can drive me a little bit nuts. And so usually I use the curves uh, to clean up my line work that I build with the paint layer. Okay. Delete that stuff. Okay. Look over to my other window over here. And we'll look, let's see, I want to make sure I cover these things, so before I forget. Uh, not that. I want to talk about symmetry, let's do that. Uh, brushes, we just talked about brushes. Let me show you how to save a brush. If you do create an interesting brush, we'll do that. Texture brushes. Okay, let's start off on symmetry and do this right. All right, I'm going to hide this guy, and we'll go into uh, 
So this is a sketch that I did over the top of uh, an outboard motor. Um, but maybe I want to come up with three or four other designs, kind of using this as kind of my shape language. Um, and so all you do, select the layer, open up the layer attribute editor, attribute editor, and turn on symmetry. And uh, you can do a number of different things with this kind of symmetry. Um, right now it is a mirror, standing for this little M. But I could do, I could do radial symmetry as well. Um, where it starts to um, play with as many different spokes maybe as I want in there. Um, I have made some interesting car design or like wheels before, but uh, for the most part, I like the mirror quite a bit. And different things you could do, I could go up here and say grab my move tool. And at this point, I'm just moving, um, just warping the layer basically. I'm just pushing it around, trying to see, if, that might be something interesting. Maybe this might make a more interesting motor. I kind of like the dual, uh, the dual exhaust on the top there. Maybe if I tilt this down this way, and I'm not trying to get like a final design, I'm just trying to get some inspiration. Um, these tools, this one right here in the middle will skew uh, well, it'll skew the image from left to right, so kind of like push it over right or left or up or down. Uh, these ones will flip the object. So this might be a good way to go. So I'll push this back in here. Try to find something interesting. It might make a very interesting creature. Hmm. Yeah, that's neat. Uh, so we come up with some neat ideas. In the end, I would take this and say bake effects if I like this one. Uh, do I want to bake the symmetry? Yeah, I do. And at that point, I would hide the one that I just baked, go back to this guy, toggle back on symmetry, and continue looking for other shapes. Um, it's a lot like photo booth, quite honestly. Um, so that was kind of a cool one, but maybe there's other ones that are better. Let's zoom back out here. And this is my own sketch, which is kind of weird, right? Um, you can also, these different, uh, these tools up here are for manipulation, like warping the layer. And I love that it will allow me to do, so the warp layer allows me to both scale, flip, but also allows me to do kind of a perspective warp, which I think that one was starting to look kind of interesting. But I can also add points to the outside of this and warp it. Um, it's just great. It's just nice that all the tools are in one tool, so I don't have to like jump in and out of different scale manipulation tools. And on that helmet I used, I used this as an example to try to fit, um, just change the proportions of the helmet over the guy's head, just to see if I like something different um, from my original sketch, right? Okay, that's probably enough of that. Um, let me delete this guy. I'll delete this one too, he's not my favorite. So you can do that with, uh, there it is. You can do that with sketches. In this case, I'm going to do the same thing with a vehicle that I, I sculpted in Mudbox um, and rendered in Showcase. I take that same, same thing, but because this is rendered, it really gives you a different look. It can really be fun. So first things first, select that and you go, wow, that is interesting already as a spaceship. Um, I mean, right? That's just like, whatever. And it's all lit up. Um, it's got these really cool details from the headlamps and the wheel looks kind of cool. Um, let me zoom out a little bit here. Let's push this up here. I mean, that's something I, I might take and sketch over the top just like that because I find that pretty interesting. Um, that's interesting too. Let me zoom out a little bit further. I really should probably, let me just, I'll just scale it down. Normally, I would just make my canvas bigger, but I don't want to mess anything up here. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting and strange design right there. So maybe I'm doing a really interesting razor, you know, shaver or something like that. I want to use a car as kind of a, a base underlay to capture some of what maybe like Audi has or a Ferrari razor. I don't know. That's That might be something that I do. Then I come in here and just say, well, actually, what I really should do is just 
come in here and tone down the opacity quite a bit. Just so, oh darn it, I let go of where I liked it. Okay, that's, okay, I'll stick with that right there. Drop that down, make a new layer above. It's just like Sketchbook Pro in the fact that you have marking menus, so you just click on something and hold, and it'll bring up marking menus. Make a new paint layer, and I can try to decide if there's something about this that I really like. Um, you know, and maybe, maybe there's something about how these, how, how this all, all this comes together down here. Well, I'm gonna, I'll push this out a little bit further. And, you know, in the end, I'm going to mirror this across, but I'm trying to decide maybe I want this to come across. I also usually sketch on a Cintiq, so I'm scratchier than I ever am, but that's okay. Um, let me say this is going to come out here, draw these lines, and I really want the surface to maybe come out and maybe drop in, kick back out, and drop back down. But I want to make sure some of these lines kind of touch each other, so turn off. Get some eraser going on there. And, and then I think I'll have this whole piece down here kind of come together. We'll just pretend like it's got some teeth in there. Okay. And let's just see what that's starting to look like. So I'm gonna I'll toggle back on or toggle on the uh, Symmetry, come on, there we go. Of what that's looking like right now, and say, yeah. Do I like what's happening there? It definitely is going to need, um, you know, some more information over here, and maybe where these lights are. I'm just going to pull it all the way across, and say I would want lights going across here, maybe, all the way into that, and. It's a little odd because I don't really know what I'm making, but you know, whatever. Anyways, um, if we took a little bit more time, you can come up with all kinds of interesting ideas. Um, I imagine that makes sense. Anyway, any questions about this? Okay, I didn't think so. Okay, um, we'll move on. Uh, okay, so toggle you and toggle you. What do I have here? Uh, texture brushes. How to create texture brushes and how to use them. So because I, because I know that I've created all these texture brushes down here um, um, with a certain kind of lighting condition, let's make a new paint layer here, um, I know that if I take these brushes and just kind of drop them on, oh, it's so, you can't really see that very well. Well, you can kind of tell that the surface now goes over here dips in and kind of pokes out, right? Like a golf ball divot, right? So I've made a bunch of, a bunch of different brushes and, and they have a similar lighting to, um, to my rendering. And so you can just basically just come in and say, well, I know that I want uh, maybe this texture. And I'm not sure why the, uh, normally I've got a, a preview and for some reason it's not on. Maybe it's because I'm using um, this over here, but the preview is nice because then I, it's, it makes it easier to deal with like knowing exactly where uh, these are placed. So I could you know, maybe do, oh, there's the preview coming on. So I can say, yeah, maybe I want this right here hmm. instead of the other one. Let me race that guy out. And we'll place a couple of these guys. Oops, wrong direction. Open that up. Rotate this around, maybe about that that way. You can drop those things on there. And this is the same stuff that you saw in the video, except for live, right? Erase some of this off here because I really don't need it. I just want that metal to just kind of barely edge over the top, and then we can zoom in and take off the edges. Because I want it to feel like this metal is raised off, right? So I'm the professor that likes to demo more than lecture. 
<laughs> it's fun. We have a good time in class. Okay. Okay. And they look like they're laying on there pretty good. Um, there are dodge and burn brushes as well. So say if I just thought maybe it just needs to roll a little bit differently there, I might grab this burn brush and just try hitting it a little bit. Oh, it doesn't look like it's hitting very well. And change this uh, intensity. So now you can see that it kind of pops right there as it goes across. Maybe do the same thing down here with this other one. And because those are the only things on that layer, um, I don't have to worry about um, about if whether or not I am. Oh, that's really big. Where's my brush size? There it is. I'm just going to come in and just start popping highlights here and there with this brush. And uh, maybe if it didn't look like it was matching the, the highlights originally, I can just kind of force it to. And it just has like, like a nice subtle um, look to it. So you can't see it, but there's a little person in there. Um, all right, so at this point, maybe I want to add some texture. We'll just do that as if I was doing this to uh, a final model. So what I really want to do is I want to make, I want to mask off this helmet. And so I'm going to use a vector because I think it's going to be easier to capture the shape um, by just redrawing this. And I'm just going to say straight edge, straight edge, come up there. And just for the sake of time, I'm just going to keep the polyline going all the way to here. And we'll just kind of come back and end it. OK, and I'm just going to snap that back to place. I think it snaps. There we go. OK, so now I've got all these curves, which you can't see very well. So I'm going to toggle this down. There we go. Hopefully, we can all see that. And go back up to my vector layer. And I'm just going to use the same simple little tool and try to generically match. Um, I'm not going to worry about it too much. Um, that one's going to be hard edge. This one's a little bit tight. Let's see what I've got here. And I've, I've, gone, I've gone way too shallow here. So I guess the question is, how do I fix that? You know, maybe fix it if I do this, this stroke that we were talking about before where it comes up. Yeah, that could, pretty much did it. Yeah. OK, so go back to my little connect the dot button thing. And all these are too shallow. What am I doing? OK. Well, I'll just try it again. Click right there. Click there to there. And I guess we'll try that same thing where I'm just going to take this guy again and just try whoa, to pull it away from the surface. Whoa. Yeah, I don't like that. Well, I'll fix it by just drawing a new curve and cutting it off. That might be the easiest way to do it. OK. And um, what's kind of cool, you can select these curves. Um, if it's got, well, let's just try this. So I can select this, and it'll select just that piece, which is pretty interesting. And you know, I'm still going to be shallow right here. Uh, Maybe I'll just redraw this. So I can also take this curve right here, select it, and grab the end and pull it out. That's going to help. Grab this curve, drag it out too. That should do the trick. OK. So um, it's got different ways to select. So I could select just the edges that kind of fall off. You just lasso select, and you can rip off those little tiny edges. And then uh, let's just see what we get here. What am I doing? OK. I need to take this whole thing and there we go. All 
All right, we'll try this. We'll see if we can get that to connect from here all the way to about there. All right, we're gonna stick with this. And kill those two little pieces. And I think I've got a watertight chunk here. So the fill tool um, is pretty neat. You can change the color, right? You can say, all right, I'm just gonna drop that gray in there, uh, change it to red, whatever it might be. That's just the flat colors. They work fine. Um, you could also use the gradient tool Gradients are great um, for coming up with just like a really quick shading, right? That's pretty cool. Um, you can do a, a radial gradient, which makes more sense for this one, probably. Uh, one of the things about the gradient tools, which I like, is that you can change where the fall off is. And you can also add, like change the colors here, so I'll make this one darker here. And maybe I want to add a different color right here. So you just kind of poke them and change the color. So maybe it needs to like go bluish before it goes black for some strange reason. Um, that's pretty cool. But that's not my mandate right now. My mandate is to go texture. So the texture one, I drop this in there. Um, and in this case, I've got this fabric texture which is kind of cool. Um, you can move it around. I'm going to make it bigger so you can grab these ends because it makes sense to me to make this look like, make, make it look a little bit like it's uh, flowing around the corners. Actually, maybe this is what I should do. Yeah, grab like this. So I want this to look like the material is bending. Ah, do that one. Drag you. And that'll, that should make it feel a lot more like it belongs there. Now, obviously, it's the wrong scale. So the cool thing is I can come in here and say, I want to just change how many times it repeats in each direction. So if this was some kind of fabric-y carbon fiber, um, now the flow of, those, of, of that fabric feels like it's wrapping a little bit. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it needs to feel a lot more a lot more round than, say, if I just splatted this texture down, right? So that might be one way to do this and say, yeah, that's pretty cool. Then come back into here and change this from a normal to, say, an overlay pattern. Or overlay filter or a soft light might be a little bit better. Um, and then maybe, in this case, drop it down. Now, if I change my original texture or my original helmet up back to its, oh, you can't see that up there, but basically it looks like carbon fiber right now. Um, looks pretty good. All right, so let's try this with a different texture because I think that one might not work. Um, one more time. So you can add whatever texture you want simply by, oops, simply by going up here and let's drag this in here. Selecting the tool editor and importing a different tool, a different texture. So I might come in here and say, use this this leather stuff that I got from Mudbox. Uh, this one's going to look pretty good. Hmm. Let's try that one. And now, you can see it looks quite a bit more like, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it looks, it's pretty cool. It looks kind of like grungy, uh, I don't know, Gears of War helmet, basically, right? And then if I change this so you can see this a little bit darker again. Oops, whoa. Texture, there we go. Bump this back up so the colors look a little bit better. And it should look kind of cool. All right. Okay, so that's probably enough with these. Now, if I do create a texture brush, which I will, um, well, let's play with it. Toggle these guys off. Okay. Okay, shoe, here we go, okay. So I sculpted this shoe, and now I just want to play with it a little bit and maybe add some leather and then create a texture brush and save it in my shelf.
So to create a texture brush, all you have to do is be on a new layer. It's going to notice if it's got transparency. Toggle that guy off. There we go. And, uh, and anything will do, quite honestly. Like, we could just say, I want to create that and turn that into a brush. It'll be its own little transparent squiggly line. Um, in this case, let's grab, say, this little logo or maybe this little thing that I did. All this really is is a circle that I snapped to. So I've got a highlight and a shadow. Let's grab that one right there. Um, all you do is you would select like these new brushes right here. Open up the option box under the custom brush. Let me move this whole thing up so it's easier to see. And then down here under the custom texture, I'm just going to say capture. Now if I capture just a use the texture, it'll be like a Photoshop captured brush. But if I use the capture texture and color, it will grab the whites and the blacks, which is nice, which is exactly what I want it to do. So make this a little bit bigger. Pick that up. Oh, and be on the right layer, which is up here. Try that again. Capture. There we go. Did it grab? Yeah, OK. Let me do that again because I kind of missed the edge there. Capture. OK, so let's see if that worked. There we go. So now I can place this thing wherever I want. You know, change the size and say I really want a circle right there. And it should look, for all intents and purposes, because it's got a similar lighting. Oh, no, it doesn't. The lighting is rotated. Um, that should help. Yeah, so now it's got a similar lighting where it's basically top lit and, uh, and the lighting should match well enough to go, okay, that makes sense. Now if you want to save that brush, all you do is whatever active brush you have, you push the plus button down here in your shelf and it will create a new uh, brush. That's kind of easy, right? And you don't have to save the shelf, which is nice because um, if anyone used to sketch an alias, like I did, um, if you didn't save your shelf, you'd lose all your brushes. It's horrible. Okay, so at that point, let's uh, do some. Let's do something with this. New poly paint here, or new paint layer. I'm just going to go back into here where I've got my leather brush, and let's just squirt leather all over this. Now, I would probably do the same thing that I did before, which was uh, um, take some time and mask this thing off. But because I'm a little bit lazy, I'm just going to fake that. Let's see. I should have made this background the same color, and I could have just selected it with a magic wand, but we'll go with this route. Um, all right, so what you can do with the, paint, with the layer editor is you can change this, obviously, to something like multiply. and it looks like leather down here. It's somewhat okay up there. We'll do the opposite. We'll go uh, maybe soft light. See a little bit better. That'll work. Um, but we can also play with the color adjustment. So we can make it brighter or darker in the color adjustment. You can add more contrast. Um, and you can change the lightness. You can add color. So if we wanted this to be like red leather. Um, it's a pretty nice feature just to be able to make all these layer adjustments right there in the, in the attribute editor, or in the, uh, the layer editor. Okay, so let's take that, and without spending too much time, I'm going to just quickly erase off what I don't need. Yeah, that's close enough. Okay. And then make a new layer. And in this case, I'm going to use the curves because I think this is going to make a lot of sense. If I use the new vector layer and just grab, say, this black line right here. Okay. I like that. We'll go black. And uh, actually, it doesn't matter if it's black or not because I basically want to put like a cut line or a seam through there. Let's do another one. 
maybe this one, oops, do that. Check that. This one I want to place right here. And we'll stick with that. And I want to tell these things to become guide curves so I can snap to them. So what you do, you select the curves and go to its tool, change it from a pencil to a guide curve. And what's neat about guide curves is I can be on a regular paint layer and now these tools make sense. So by default, you've got the left selected, which is just um, paint uh, wherever you want to with your, with your strokes. This one will stick to a curve, though. So if I'm somewhat close to a curve, I can put my seams right in there. And they'll be entirely stuck to it. The next one over is, is I don't want to be on the seams. I want to be like just offset from it. So let's get a white brush and just stroke a little bit on this right side, a little bit, little bit down on the left side or the right side of this, just so it kind of picks up that highlight. And because it's just me stroking, I can decide how, how firm my hand is on that. I can toggle off the vectors. In this case, it's a really, really sharp cut line, like this was a product made out of plastic. So that's not cool. Um, so I might tone it down, but I also might blur it in this case because um, it's leather. It needs to be a little bit more diffuse than that. So I'm just going to blur that away with the blur brush. How does that work? Uh, whatever. It's, it's okay. And then I'll, I'll toggle this back on and just make a nice sharp groove in the middle. So go back to the center stack. Go black. And just lay that in. Mm-hmm. Was there a question? Okay. And then uh, last thing we'll do with this is let's throw like some stitches in here. So this stitch is really big. I can make that fairly tiny. Leave it on center and just let it stroke across that line and stroke across this line. And I've got these nice, oh, you can't see them very well. I don't know. Let's zoom in. Anyways, there they are. These nice little tight little stitches that are kind of like embedded in the seam. Um, that's really nice. It's a wonderful way to play. Um, so I mean, that's going to take me a lot less time than it is to even sculpt it. And this kind of sculpting is pretty fast. But in this case, I can come up with lots of ideas really quickly. OK, question? Oh, I know what. We're probably getting close. Oh, yeah, we are close. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so same thing. They're the same tools. Because all the, all the vector does is, say if I've got this one right here, which is um, my little hex head, if I open this up in the vector, all it's going to tell me is the exact same thing as if it was a, uh, the paint one. Um, it's going to show that I've got a minimum and maximum radius, minimum max opacity, sharpness, rotate, um, and the different capture tools. I can change the spacing. Uh, which can be kind of cool if you ever want to do like a braided coil. Or, um, oh, come on, little guy. A little bit more than that. I can use a mouse. Yeah, like right about here maybe. We could do uh, some really cool snaky things. Um, if we needed to have your shoe plug into a oxygen tank. Um, <laughs> it might be useful, I guess, right? I, a long time ago I made like a lens flare, which looked kind of cool just for the extra bling occasionally right there. Um, and uh, I mean, like I said, these should all be on Autodesk's website. If not, I can uh, tell Chris Young to post them again. Um, made some wood. So it's just a simple piece of scanned wood that I just kind of like grabbed. And you basically have a little bit of randomness to um, the spacing noise and rotation noise sometimes. And you'll get a nice clean wood. And you can just kind of place it on something. And then you just use say, the overlay or soft light, and it'll blend right in, well, call it blends away right there, but it'll blend beautifully over uh, um, my screen, right? OK. Uh, after the fact. So let me just ditch this layer really quickly. See if we had this guy again, and I needed to make it look like it was laying down on the top of that. It's got the right lighting, but it's not making sense, right? So it's pretty easy to just come in after the fact and say, I want to 
put this thing in perspective. Right. Um, you can turn on grids and kind of like match scale if you want, right? Um, one thing that is kind of cool about the grids is they are also guide curves. So you can snap to them just like you can these other guide curves. So maybe I want to match this perspective, right? So let's zoom out. I want to know that, that this shoe... It basically, I mean, the shoe, shoes are not like squares, so it's not going to be exact. But um, I'm going to say maybe that needs to be, I'm trying to think where the horizon line should be. Probably looking at this front right here of the, of the shoe, that line should probably be going out that way. And I'm just going to match the heel and that. We'll say that that's probably, well, not quite. A little further out. That's probably a, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel like I missed the perspective if I use that as my kind of base underlay perspective. And then you can just start sketching using this, this curve. Um, like I said, if I've got my, my curve snaps turned on, my brushes will snap to these. And I can have like these really cool stripe lines going through in perspective. And then when I toggle this stuff off, I've got these lines that are now perfectly snapped into perspective. So that's... The perspective is pretty cool. Let me check really quick and see if I'm not missing anything else in the PowerPoint that I wanted to talk about. We talked about brushes, texture brushes, curves, curves snapping. We didn't talk at all about masks. We did talk about fills. And I showed you some of the layer options. Um, the masking, quickly touch on that. Masking, uh, what you can do there is uh, you can create a new vector mask and then just use curves in here. Oops. Uh, curves. Where, where am I? Whoa. Oh, what have I got going on? I'm scared about what just happened there. Let's go to the new paint mask. Uh, paint masks, you can... Uh, oh, I think the problem is, is I didn't have, a, I didn't have any of my layers turned on. Let's see if that works. I'm shocked. Go back to my layer. We'll try one more thing. If I did this and I convert it, there we go. That's what the layers, the mask should look like, right? So that's a paint mask, um, and uh, it'll it'll show up red. You can you can hide the visibility of the paint mask, and it'll still be masked. Um, those are great. The thing I like about the paint mask is you can invert them, so you can toggle that back and forth really quickly. Um, but one thing that is possibly even nicer is what I use in Photoshop when I'm painting there, which is um, if I've got an object here, I just have to toggle off my, my mask altogether. Um, I, can, I can continue painting in here, but use the preserve transparency. If you use that in Photoshop, it's a great tool. Um, so I turn the lock on, and what that's going to do is make it so that I can paint, paint a different color, but it can only paint inside that object. And it's a wonderful way to say, now I need to maybe give this some shading. So I'll go down here, and give it a bit of a core shadow. Oops, not that. Airbrush. There we go. And we can start painting in a core shadow. I'm going to have it roll off the top here. Come in, grab some light. Of course, this is a very strange looking shape here, but that's okay. Strange looking shape. Anyways, but the nice thing about that is it's, it, it'll preserve the transparency so I can't paint off of it. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking it really needs to reflect its environment a little bit. So I'm going to paint. Sorry, which one? No. That would be cool. Sketchbook Pro has, has some of that stuff going on now, like, which is co kind of cool. Um, it's got like oil paints and a bunch of cool stuff in Sketchbook Pro. And I'm not sure what they're going to, I mean, I don't work for Autodesk, so I don't know, but I don't know if they're going to start pushing things back and forth, but for the most part. Yeah, I use, I use Sketchbook Pro for doing characters probably more. 
And when I'm doing things like spaceships, I'll probably come in here if I want to tighten them up and dial them in. Um, anyways, you guys, I think I'm going to end by going back into PowerPoint and uh, let me see from current slide. Um, kind of went through this already, visual development process. Uh, and just show a couple examples of what you can do. If we have more time, I was just going to do one of these, but they're really quick and easy to do. A um, couple examples of doing symmetry off of fish and then taking those and building them in 3D. The guy on the right, the pirate looking thing, is just jellyfish and coral. Um, and this guy was a flower, a pitcher plant um, that I turned into, in my, I built him. And so we talked about design principles, phases of design. Uh, we looked at tools for ideation and rendering. And um, if you want to see, I've got a lot of videos posted on YouTube for sculpting and some sketching. Um, you can find me just by typing in my name in some random words like ZBrush. And you'll find me. And thank you very much. Yeah.